Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining the session around the impact of business school research on wider management communities and organisations. I'm Jim Johnston of the new British Academy of Management Network for Management Consulting, which is one of the, uh, the driving forces behind us. I'm grateful to the wider community, some of whom you meet today, for making this happen. I'm literally only running the session with more knowledgeable people than I to listen to. The people joining are Professor Nick Beach, which I know most of you have heard of, may not have heard. Nick's joining this be well beyond his role of President of BAM and Vice-Chancellor of Middlesex University, but he's been one of the editors in BAM's book series on management impact and indeed was a co-author on delivering impact in management research with other members of the community. So uh, he's been asked to you know, make intelligent comments, etc. as we know Nick's capable of. Carol is joining us both through BAM, but also part of the Centre for Management Consulting Excellence and the Fellow of Institute of Consulting with many years experience as a management consultant. He keeps telling me he's retiring, but he's here, so he's maybe not retired quite yet. We've also been joined by a pre-recorded video by Simon Haslam of Durham University Business School, who's got connections that span between academic, clearly from Durham University and industry associations. And finally, by no means least, is Terry Corby, who's been a founding chief executive officer of Good Business Pays Community Interest Company, and had previously worked with Accenture, KPMG, and other consultancy organisations. He was the global head of thought leadership, which is always a very impressive title. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing what Terry's got to say about that. And has worked with various universities and academics in his career. I'm very much looking for today's session to be informative, helpful, and get the new network off to an extremely ambitious start, feeding into the research activities of how do we make the impact better, more effective, whatever better and more effective means. So if everything's okay, I would like to pass over to Nick to talk. We're looking for comments, questions in the live Q&A box. We do have IT backup from somebody who will put them into the chat, and we are looking for not an hour of just talking at you, but hopefully some questions that we can explore and discuss. I was slightly alarmed to discover we've got a strict one hour, and given that I always overrun, that could be a bit of a challenge, but the, it will be captured, it is going to be recorded. If anybody wants to follow up with any of the members, then we can explore that as well. Over to you, Nick. Brilliant. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jim. And a delight to be here with everybody and, and uh, to be on the panel with these um, uh, illustrious colleagues. Um, what I'd like to say is really centered on the idea of learning. And the reason for that is that when we're thinking about change really of any sort that involves people, there's a degree to which you're looking either at behavioral change, conceptual change, but quite often um, in the sorts of changes we want to make in organization and business, there's a level of personal and sometimes cultural change, which run far deeper. And that's why I think actually a lot of that um, change really comes about when people are learning, developing alternative ways of being, ways of thinking and ways of acting. So in order to do that, what is the question? Well, our question is, in a sense, what is the role of research, of consultancy and the role of practice? And to what degree are these things genuinely separate? And in what ways might they join up? Now, I think one of the really interesting opportunities around consulting is the notion of translation. And a, a traditional view, not one that um, I think captures all of the work that goes on in business and management, but a traditional view is that innovation and new ideas will be produced, um, particularly in research-oriented activities. And uh, in practice-oriented activities, it's quite difficult to pick up on the recent research because of the busyness of life um, uh, and the, uh, in, in effect, the, the, the demand to perform in the moment. 
And consultancy is often a, a way in which people who are in practice pick up on, can make use of, and can adapt the sorts of things that are produced through research. Now, I think that is a really interesting um, question, uh, first of all, on the pipeline idea. So does it really work that ideas are produced in one place, practice is another place, and there's this flow through and there's a translation to go on? My own view is that it's far less simple than that and far more interesting, actually. And that, in fact, new ideas are produced in all sorts of places by these different parties. And consultancy that is done really well is actually about a form not just of smoothing over, but of disruption that doesn't just take uh, certain elements of research and say, and this is what you ought to do and perhaps change the language to make it um, more achievable, but really is about saying there is a set of resources. Some of these ideas come from other companies, from other practices, from research, and that informs a set of questions and way of thinking that can be brought to bear on current problems. And learning at the heart of that, and this is the, the ideas really of uh, Kund Illyris, is about difference. So it's not about similarity. It's not about saying we all agree on this. It's actually fundamentally saying there is something we want to change at the moment. There is some degree of disruption, which could be cognitive, could be behavioral, could be cultural. And what we can bring to bear through consultancy is not eliminating or smoothing over that difference, but actually using it as a point of learning. And at the point of difference, that is when people are often motivated to try and think uh, differently and to some extent to change themselves. That can then be stimulated, not just by ideas from research. I think that is an important source. But what I would like to argue is um, an important part of this process is one of moving practice from one place to another. And that a lot of what we do in our normal lives is, in fact, to pick up practices, behaviours and activities from one situation and then try to reapply them with and through people in other situations. And that itself is a really challenging form of translation because, of course, you move context, you move meaning and it involves a degree of reinterpretation. So I would see this as being far from a passive flow down a pipeline of ideas to practice and much more a flow and an interrupted flow and a disturbed flow of practices from one context to another. And it's that disturbance actually that is really important to us. So at the heart of that, I think is a form of learning that is about dialogue. And dialogue from this learning perspective is not about um, one person trying to express an idea to another so that the other person changes. It's almost the reverse of that. It's about how we as practitioners enter into a dialogue prepared to change, prepared to learn, and what do we take away from that dialogue that means that we are different as a result of it? So there's that really important dialogue translation process, which I would like to argue is not a single flow, but it's actually a multi-way learning orientation. The last thing that I wanted to just mention around that is this is not a, a kind of inhuman or a human process. When we're involved in these processes of learning, we are our whole selves. We're emotional. We have anxieties and hopes and aspirations and passions. We're engaged with others, some of whom we like, some of whom we might not like so much, some of whom um, produce great outcomes, others of whom maybe we don't agree with. So actually the consultancy process is also one in which we have to take care and take awareness of how that is landing emotionally, how that um, amplifies certain decisions or quietens others, and, um, and what that then produces in terms of commitment to change. And I'm deliberately using the word commitment as uh, a notion that isn't purely cognitive, but is also emotional and whole person. So I think what I, well, what I, in summary, what I'd like to suggest is that if we want to increase the impact of research through management consulting, first of all, we need to think about research as a form of learning in which we're inquiring, working out something new and different about the world. Secondly, we need to move away from a traditional or simplistic pipeline model in which some people have the ideas and other people are doing the doing and we'll have a, a flow of, of, of activity in that way. And actually what we need to think about is all of us playing slightly different roles in a learning dialogue, but that difference isn't something we ought to be shy of or ashamed of or try and eliminate. Actually, 
I think the difference is what brings a value to that very dialogue. So I hope that um, uh, provides at least one point of view uh, and uh, I'm happy to discuss later. Thank, thanks, Jim. Uh, thank you, Nick, for that. It's, I did enjoy it. You've got one of the two ideas that I may follow up with you myself later at some point. Can I pass on to Carol now, who's got some different uh, perspectives, just exactly as Nick was talking about and, and leading some research that's been done, etc. And I'm sure Carol, with his extensive experience and thought, will be able to con contribute to the discussion. Carol, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Jim. Um, and in particular, I'd like to say something about the project that uh, the Management Consulting Network is launching. Um, I'll just, uh, with that, launch some slides. And hopefully a slideshow. Yes, um, I say we're, uh, the Management Consulting Network is launching a project on increasing the impact of research through management consultancy. And on the project, we intend to work with BAM special interest groups to pull together existing knowledge on the subject, because we're aware that, that there is a lot of existing knowledge out there in BAM. We do know that management consultants use the findings of academic research. Um, we're not talking about all consultants or all of the time, but we know that on occasions, consultants do use the findings of academic research. The Centre for Management Consulting Excellence carried out some exploratory research recently into how research contributes to consulting practice. Uh, we went into the details at the MCN's launch event a few months ago, so I'll just summarise them here. Uh, and essentially, we found that academic research contributes to consulting practice in, in four main ways. Firstly, as a source of ideas underlying major types of consulting interventions and of widely used consulting tools. And although a minimal percentage of academic papers are taken up in this way, those that are are, are highly influential. Uh, think about uh, areas of, of activity like business process redesign, for example, all of which originated from academic research. Secondly, uh, consultants look for inputs for use on a specific project. Uh, quite often they find themselves in a situation where they need something, whether it's uh, a model, a framework, or some data to help with the project they're working on. Um, so they look around for sources of, of this material, uh, and they often turn to the outputs of academic research because they know it's, it's a source they can trust. Thirdly, the outputs of academic research contribute to consultants continuing professional development. It's particularly important for consultants to keep up with academic research, um, as well as other developments in their domain of expertise. Um, although consultants usually rely on secondary sources rather than reading academic papers, it may be, for example, books written by academic for a more general audience, but certainly the outputs of academic research are an important uh, input to consultants continuing professional development. Those are the three areas which we discussed at the, the MCN launch event. Uh, but since then, we went back and looked at our data and identified a fourth important way in which consultants use research outputs that we didn't highlight at the, the previous event. Many consulting firms and individual consultants like to publish so-called thought leadership materials where they present new ideas to their customers for marketing purposes. Academic research is a very useful source of content for these thought leadership materials. So we, in sum, we believe that management consultancy is an attractive channel for achieving impact. Um, I've just reviewed the various ways in which consultants look to academic research as a source of ideas and information. But in addition, by the very nature of consultancy work, as Nick already touched on, um, the work typically involves working with a series of other organizations um, and potentially circulating thought leadership materials to many more, so that uh, consultants often disseminate new ideas, um, often to many other organizations, uh, and thereby potentially substantially increasing their impact. 
That's why the Management Consulting Network is launching a project on increasing the impact of research through management consultancy. The next step will be to form a working group to bring together knowledge on this subject, uh, build on previous work in BAM, because um, as Jim and, and Nick have already touched on, there's been a considerable record of previous work in, in BAM on this subject, on, on the general subject of, of increasing the impact of research. And also we want to bring together the expertise and the special interest groups. Although we're focusing on management consultants, it may well be the case that uh, ways of achieving impact involving consultants may actually generalize to other groups of intermediaries as well. So the, the ripples may spread wider. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jim. That's all I have to say for the moment. Thank you, Carol. And thank you very much for the what you've done in this and the future agenda that we, you've explained here. And obviously we welcome contributions from the wider BAM community as we would expect and as we certainly know. I would like now to introduce what will be pre-recorded video from Professor Simon Haslam of Durham University. He typifies the example of clearly a hugely respected academic, but also works heavily in the management consulting community, as well as being founding editor of the Management Consulting Journal, all is an excellent blend of practice academic and community work is very valuable. So there'll be a relatively short pre-recorded video from Simon and then we can move on. Hello, my name's Simon Haslam and I'm delighted to be part of this panel and to have the opportunity to share a couple of avenues of potential for increasing the impact of research into management consultancy. My role is visiting professor at the Durham University Business School in the Northeast of England. And for the past two and a half decades, I've been a practicing strategy consultant, owning and running a boutique consultancy with an international client base. The two avenues I'd like to share with you uh, are firstly, the management consulting journal. And secondly, the Academic Fellowship of the ICMCI. Let me start with the Management Consulting Journal. It was in 2017, myself and a couple of colleagues, we would recognize a gap in the academic literature around management consulting. So we founded the Management Consulting Journal as a focused publication dealing with bringing research into the realm of practice in the management consultancy sphere. We are published by the organization Siendo, uh, which gives the journal contact with the online databases and search engines. And we typically publish two times a year. Uh, there's an independent editorial board for the management consulting journal. And the journal is supported by its own website, as well as its space on the Siendo de Gruyter publishing website. And you can also find the journal on LinkedIn. In terms of its ability to have the increase in the impact of research, two possibilities uh, for yourselves for consideration, please. The first is as researchers and academics, uh, we would be very interested in receiving papers from you. Uh, we typically take the papers in two forms, uh, full length articles, uh, so papers of four to 7,000, 4,000 to 7,000 words. And also we're interested in shorter pieces of the 1,000 to 2,000 words. The details of how to submit and the submission templates are available on the Management Consulting Journal website. And if you have any questions uh, towards the end of this particular slot, I'll put my email address onto the screen uh, and please feel able to contact me directly as the, the founding editor. The second possibility is we are always looking to augment the editorial board. So uh, the editorial board is independent of the 
publication itself in terms of objectivity. And we're looking for senior academics uh, with a proficiency and profile in management consulting to join our group. So hopefully Management Consulting Journal uh, seeks to help the transmission of the impact of research into consulting practice. And the second of the two possibilities I'd like to just discuss is the ICMCI Academic Fellowship. The ICMCI is the International, Cons uh, International Council of Management Consulting Institutes. It is a global body, uh, so an NGO, a not for distributed profit, non governmental organization. And its global footprint encompasses countries that collectively account for 80% of the management consulting industry. And each of these countries has what's called an IMC, which is an Institute of Management Consultancy. In the UK, that IMC is the Institute of Consulting, and I sit on the Advisory Council. My role with the ICMCI is the Chair of the Academic Fellows. So within the International Council of Management Consulting Institutes, there are a group of around 70 academics who are people with a genuine research interest or teaching interest in management consulting in different geographies representing different institutes of higher education universities 30 organizations around the world and we meet together albeit virtually uh, to share ideas sometimes to think about research endeavors and we are the conduit between the research community and the institutes of management consulting and their focus on individual consultants and consulting firms. The reason for me sharing with this is some of you will already be academic fellows within the ICMCI community. And thank you for so being an academic fellow and hope you continue in that role and to share ideas. But others may not be. And so the possibility is if you are interested in becoming an ac academic fellow of the ICMCI, uh, then the nomination process uh, is enabled through the national IMC. So the Institute of Management Consultancy for the country in, in which you're based. And if you don't have a direct contact to that institute, then please drop me an email and I can follow up that interest with you and connect you with the IMC. And we are looking, this is the ICMCI, to further strengthen the global community of academic fellows. And the stronger this community, uh, the more robust the global link is between the various pockets of consulting research and the movement consulting practice. And I think what we're seeking to do as the ICMCI, as a global body, as an NGO, is to work to the development of quality, professionalism and standards in management consulting practice. And we would appreciate the distinction between established economies where the consulting markets are very well developed and those parts of the world whose economies are going through the development stage and the consulting infrastructure is growing and developing in parallel. So the second of two possibilities, uh, from my point of view, of helping improve the impact of researching the consulting is for us members of the academic community to connect with the ICMCI uh, through becoming an ac academic fellow. So, in conclusion, let me just uh, share my screen here. Uh, there's my email address. So, Professor Simon Haslam, uh, I'm giving you my personal email address. So, simon at consult.co.uk. Um, if you would like to have a connection with the Management Consulting Journal, or you would like to become an ICMCI academic fellow, and you'd like to know how to do that, uh, drop me a line. I'll follow up with you. And thank you for the opportunity to be part of the panel. Oh, thanks, due to Simon, for that. Much appreciated. I like to introduce uh, an speaker who kindly joined us that I've introduced briefly already, Terry Corby, who will speak around his 
views and thoughts on the issue we've discussed, clearly capable of speaking both the academic community and the management community, and the combinations that I think that Carol and Nick have been hinting at, as well as the similar things that Simon has been doing. So over to you, Terry, when you're ready, please. Oh, thank you for that. Um, yes, I, I uh, spent about 10 years as head of global thought leadership at Accenture. Uh, that was the major role that probably qualifies me to talk a little bit about uh, some of this stuff here. So I've worked in quite a few different consulting firms and with many different academic uh, organizations and individuals. And so probably one of the things I'll be talking about is um, understanding the difference and aligning uh, interests, the interests of the consulting firm in brackets and their clients, because that's who they're measured by, and the academic organization and the academic individuals, and, and making sure you get that right. And I wanted to pick up on a couple of things I noted that Nick said that I think is very important. Um, and it starts with, you know, sort of why would a consultant uh, seek out or want to work with academia in the first place? Um, and um, uh, Nick talked about learning something new and different as quite an important role. And this is uh, very, very important when it comes to consultancy work, because the clients that are the people that pay the bills at the management consulting firms often think of their world from an inside out perspective. They think they understand what the customers want, how the world's going to change. And uh, the opportunities in front of them are quite uh, narrow, really, when they think, when they use their own set of thoughts, which is sitting in an ivory tower or even in the bedroom on Zoom or wherever it happens to be, uh, wondering what the next problem is they're going to solve. If they were to ask customers from the outside, how could you help us? The answer would be much broader. And uh, part of a consultant's job is to help their clients think more broadly about how to solve these big problems. And even in consulting firms, you can be driven to think from an inside out perspective. You're driven by targets, you're driven by models, and you're driven by the culture of the firm that you work within. Um, and so it's very important to get outside thinking. So I think that idea of learning something new and different is where there's an opportunity to make a greater impact by working with academia because they're not restricted by the same kind of, you know, sort of well, restrictions that consultants and their clients have. Um, the second thing that Nick mentioned was understanding the difference in the dialogue. And I think this is also important when we think about the relationship between consultants and academia. Uh, they, I'm going to talk a little bit about what drives the consultant. Uh, I, I know a bit about what drives people in academia, but I know a lot more about what drives consultants in terms of their, you know, when they get to work on a Monday morning or a Sunday night. And uh, those are the things that, that really keep them awake at night, which is a phrase that consultants like to, 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 to use sometimes. So that alignment of what's the exam question? What does success look like? Getting that bit right is very, very important um, because if those two things are not aligned, uh, you'll end up with a bit of a car crash and some, uh, some expensive research programs and some expensive marketing programs from consulting firms. So uh, firstly, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the drivers of consulting firms using academia. Why do they use, why do they use uh, academia? And I wrote down a few things. Um, testing new ideas, testing hypotheses. This is very important. You know, you can get caught in this. This is the way we always do things. A cookie cutter approach to solving client problems. But when you want to test new ideas and develop hypotheses, academia is important. Uh, the consultant wants to see their ideas and their approaches as being rigorous. Uh, they don't want to see thought leadership, which is a sort of round term really for new ideas and bits of innovation. They don't want to see, they don't want their clients to see that as purely marketing material. You know, I, I used to teach at St. Charles, which was our university at uh, Anderson and, and Accenture. And I would talk about the fact that, you know, that the worse the idea, the more I'd have to spend on marketing, the better the idea that comes out of thought leadership. I don't have to spend anything in marketing. You know, if you tell me you've got a cure for cancer, all I need is a phone. I don't need any marketing money. So, you know, making sure 
that uh, thought leadership is true leading thoughts, new ideas, and not just marketing material is important to consultants. And that's where academia can help. Uh, being better than their competition. You know, there are, there's lots of competition amongst the consulting firms and consultants. Uh, working with academia helps them stand out as being different. Um, providing a level of comfort and trust to their clients that the ideas they're going to be implementing are real and rigorous and they'll work. You know, that's important. And building assets and capability, and I think Nick touched on this a little bit, is that you're not just creating solutions for your client, but you're also building a capability. Uh, when I joined at Anderson, we had 60,000. We now have, or they now have, 325,000 people in that organization. They have to teach those people ways of doing things so that can be replicated across the world. And academia helps that happen. And I've noticed over the years, actually, the switch between people leaving academia and going into consulting firms and people going from consulting firms into academia as well. It's a sort of, uh, uh, it's a sort of switching profession now, um, both benefit from each other. But the life of the consultant, and I think this is important to think about when you're looking at it from a, an academia perspective and thinking about who could we work with, is important to understand what they're driven by. So they're driven by the market. Right? These people in these jobs are, well, first of all, you have to understand there are different types of consultants and consulting firms. Everything from an individual person, you know, sole trader on their own, to the many different flavors of consulting firms that are out there. You've got McKinsey at one end, for instance, that's going to be entirely interested in corporate strategy, isn't going to be a lot less interested in operational strategy and the stuff further down the chain, you know, how a lot of the widgets work, they'll be interested in the strategy. There are the Accentures that will be the other way around. They're interested in the operational strategy. They will be interested in corporate strategy, but they're interested in how things work. There will be the accounting firms that have consulting arms that are interested in the financial side of how uh, operations work. So think about the organization, the culture of the organization, what it's trying to do with its clients before you choose who to partner with. But remember, they're driven by the market that they sit in. They're also driven by the firm that they sit in. Most are partners. That means they're owner operators of that firm. That means they're driven by revenue targets and measured by their fellow partners on how successful they are at bringing in money and keeping people busy. So the more complex the idea, the bigger the project, the longer the project, the better the outcome for the consultant. They will like to create complicated stuff in order to solve that. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. That's just the way it is. Um, they, uh, they, so they're fee earning. And that's important when you think about ideas and getting alignment that it's not all about experimentation. It may be for the academic about experimentation but the last thing i wanted to say is around measures aligning on measures how are people measured in terms of success the consultant uh, can't just experiment with new ideas in their client where they're being paid a very high daily rate they're going to be measured on the outcomes that they deliver for that client and those me that means it's going to be faster it's going to be better it's going to be cheaper it's going to be made going to make more money or save lots of money so thinking about those outcomes and how that consultant is going to be measured is important again to think about is this the right research project to work with this consultant on some consultants are very happy to work on the basis of we don't know the outcome of this project the whole idea of the project is to test a hypothesis when you put new products and services into the market, customers don't tend to use them in the way you want them to use them. They do different things with them. And that's good because you're learning. But you've got to have the right client, the right consulting firm to work with on that basis. Others will want surety, models, tools, assets. So uh, I think all I'm saying here is understand the drivers of the individual and the drivers of the firm, understand the measures of success, 
that that person has for the projects they're working on. And then you'll find the alignment between what you want to do and what they want to do much easier to land on and you'll get greater impact and so will they. Is that okay? Yeah, that's excellent, Terry. Thank you very much for that. <coughs> Pardon me. Can, can I uh, ask each of you to respond to what we've just been through? Clearly we can pick up with Simon afterwards if you wish to explore what you've said, any responses you wish to make? Don't want to point the finger at anybody and go, what do you think? So over to you. Shall I jump in, um, Jim? Not wishing to be Welcome. pushy. Um, I, fa fabulous session so far, and I was um, really interested in each of the speakers. One of the things that Terry um, well, that came across to me quite strongly from Terry's uh, thoughts was not just the different people involved, but the different um, contexts of meaning and measurement that they're involved in. And that actually being aware of each other's drivers and the, and the way that we're all measured are utterly crucial to the way that we can then engage with each other and how much time we can spend and how much resource is appropriate and what counts as a good one. All of those things, I think, um, you know, really uh, came across very strongly to me. And I thought the um, points that Carol and Simon had talked about as, as network opportunities were really great for um, meeting places for those different um, uh, different roles and different identities, really. But I guess, um, and this is perhaps a, a question to some extent for Carol and uh, for Terry, what, what would make those meeting environments attractive and, and useful for consultants when they are driven by the market that, are, that they're in, the firm that they're in, time is you know a, a, a scarce resource, those sorts of things. And, and, and there are other things that we could do that would help a kind of timely form of interaction between consultants and um, academics. Um, I, I can see Carol's on mute, so I'll take a stab at, uh, at jumping in. The, the trick, I think, and it's not a sophisticated one, is, is keep the lines of dialogue open. Um, because, and, and some of the things that Simon and Carol mentioned, of course, are the trick to this, which is, unless you're aware of someone who's doing some research or they've got a particular skill in a certain area, unless you're aware of them, they're not front of mind. When a client asks you on a Monday morning, can you help me solve this problem? The job of a consultant is always to say yes. So when, when you go into a client and, and say, I think the answer to your problem is this, and the client said, no, I don't want that. I want that. Can you do that? The answer always has to be yes. Um, because as a consultant, you're supposed to know the answer to everything. I'm being a bit sort of flippant, but you know what I mean? You, at least you should know who to call to get the right answer. So once you've said yes, you may not necessarily know the answer to that question first off, but you have to have a really good network, a really good set of people or ideas or uh, connections to allow you to build the right team who might be able to answer that problem. A lot of consulting, particularly top level consulting, is built on trust between a trust relationship between a client and a consultant. So a client will go to an individual person, whatever the firm, and say, Carol helped me when he was over there in that firm. Even though I know it's not his bag, I'm going to call him because I trust him to help me solve this problem. Now, you can't expect Carol or anyone else to, answer, to, to know the answer to every question. But if they know how to put together a team to get to the right answer, then that's great. And they'll only know you or me or anyone else if the lines of communication are open. So it's actually about keeping the network alive um, rather than trying to force something through and just have those open conversations. Yes, if, if I could possibly add to that, 
Um, firstly, apologies to Terry for caricaturing thought leadership. Um, some, some of it is marketing, but obviously, you know, the, the genuinely, many of the genuinely new, or at least some of the genuinely new ideas in consulting came from academia. Um, you know, I quoted business process re-engineering, it was historically one uh, I was close to, although not, not particularly involved in myself, but there, there are a number of other um, major interventions and, and tools which, which, are, which have come from academia um, as a result of the, the kinds of interactions that we're discussing. Um, and I think, I think I'd like to pick up on the, this, uh, Terry, Terry's other point of, of opening up the lines of communication. Um, I, I guess both sides have to, to take initiatives there. Um, but, um, you know, if I can venture to suggest from the academic side, I think the, the first step is probably letting the world outside academia know that you're there and have some, some interesting ideas. Um, sadly, consultants don't read academic papers unless they're absolutely desperate. Um, there are obviously individual exceptions to that, but, but by and large, that's true. So um, if you think you have ideas uh, that, that, that might be of interest to you know, the management world in general, to consultants, um, please put them out there in some form other than academic papers. I mean, it, you know, it may be uh, articles for business journals. Um, it may be a book written for a more general readership. Um, it might be uh, running a workshop for a professional society. There, there are lots of different ways, um, but yeah, essentially marketing your ideas, getting your ideas out there in places where, where people might pick them up um, is a good first step, and particularly if you're fairly early uh, on the path in, in your academic career. Um, take those first steps to getting your ideas out into the, the wider world. Um, because relying on chance uh, is, is, is not a, doesn't offer great, great hopes for success in, in, in that respect. Um, can I have a go at answering a question that came in on the side from uh, Richard L? Jim, would please, that be okay? Please, I, I would be excellent because I suspect I don't understand it. I also think I know who the author is, and he's yeah. far more intelligent than I, so feel free to step in and rescue me a little. So uh, that's okay, because I, I recognise the question. I don't know if everybody can see the question. No. Um, so I'll just read it out. Before entering education, I spent some years as a strategy consultant. I support developing stronger links between uni research and consultancy. But how does client ownership fit here? So I, I recognise the, the, the question. So you, you've got... Uh, a university, you've got a consulting firm in the middle, and then you've got a client, Coca-Cola or whatever company it is, doesn't matter at the end. Um, and you've got their customers, by the way, beyond that, but that's that's another thing. So um, the question around client ownership as it relates to this topic we're talking about depends on what the research objective is. And I come back to alignment again. For example, um, if you're trying to develop a new method of IT integration and you haven't yet, you know that there's a problem in the market, but you haven't identified a client yet, but you're trying to create a new capability for your organization, then you are the client of the consulting firm. And so the, the ownership, if you want, and I think what you mean by ownership is the engagement um, is the consulting firm and the uni. If, however, you're trying to solve the problem of, you know, how do we get people to buy more burgers in your McDonald's or something? It's a very specific problem for a specific client. If academia comes into that process, then I would say there's a sort of three-legged stool there where you bring the client and the consulting firm and the uni into, into, uh, into the same conversation, because ultimately you want thoughts around the table, which can come from all three areas, as Nick said earlier on, but let's assume that lots of thoughts might come out of academia. You need the client McDonald's to be able to tell you that won't work or that will work because of the logistics or the shape of their organization. 
and you need a consulting firm in this case to help create the capability, the change, or to, to help drive that change. Um, and the ownership of the IP can fit anywhere. That's just down to the contractor. But that's, so this wasn't a simple answer, but hopefully it got to Richard's question. Thank you for that, Terry. That was very helpful. Okay. As we are encouraging other people to come into live Q&A, but one, one thing I noted from earlier on that we'll not come back to, and I have some experience of working in knowledge exchange myself, that I find I do, that was the word that Nick used earlier on around translation and not being a one-way process. Uh, can you care to respond to that? Because it would be useful, I think, to explain what that means in, to you. I know what it means in my view, but that's irrelevant. What do you guys think? Just expand on it, Nick, if you could. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, um, so one of the things I think about um, translation is that it's uh, essentially an active process. And it's an active process in which new meanings are made. So it's, it isn't, I think, in these sorts of environments, very rarely is it that we just pick up a practice from McDonald's and think, well, that would work fantastically in company X. And we just imitate it and move it. The very act of moving, I think, often changes the practice itself. At least in a new context, it's going to have to be adapted. And very rarely can you just um, adopt. I think there's always adaption. And so I, I think uh, being quite explicit about that as an active um, process is very important. But I think that then does raise really interesting questions about where the value is being added and what the value means. And in other words, and coming back to the question about, well, what does a good one look like? Um, because I suspect that from this way of thinking, we want clients to be active, participating, involved in um, developing solutions, not just passive recipients. But of course, that means that they are then paying for the privilege of being actively involved in producing something that might or might not lead to IP, but will lead to novel um, uh, novel outcomes. And that then actually raises the kind of interesting question for the consultant, what are we doing in this process that everybody else sees of, of being of, of value? Now, I think there is a number of levels to that. One, I think, and particularly this, Carol has covered this really well, I think, a lot of this stuff just would not happen if it wasn't for the consultants. You know, the academics, you know, we enjoy publishing stuff in the journals that we publish in, partly because, as Terry was saying, that's where we get measured, that's where our rewards and punishments sit, that's how we build careers, all of that sort of stuff. But what we're really doing in most of those journals, uh, and Simon was setting up a journal to do something different to this, but most journals, we're talking to the rest of our academic community. We're not actually aiming to talk to other people. Um, and so the I, I think that that there is this kind of really crucial element of, of connection through translation. But secondly, I think it is something in which the consultant has to be quite, um, to use another metaphor, ambidextrous, that they need to be able to talk several languages, but also I think they need to be able to engage with the world of academia and with the world of practice in a way that enables them to know enough about both of those to, to connect. So almost they become, I, I think good, good consultants become cultural travelers in a way, in that they can get into a business or an organization. And Terry was saying, you know, ultimately the answer, you know, the answer has to be yes. Well, that's huge adaptability. It's also about understanding how you're accepted to them. Both Carol and, and Terry talked about trust. And I think that's, you know, again, it, it, you know, in academic terms, you're almost like an ethnographer going into a new culture and becoming close enough to it to become persuasive and useful to them. And equally to have, be doing that with the academic side as well. So I think there's, you know, it's not a trivial thing to say, oh, well, you can just pick up something and translate it. I don't think it, it's not like a kind of, you know, a school uh, exercise in which you've got a passage in choose your favorite language and you've got to translate it into another language. And then we say, well, 70%. It's not like that at all. I think it's a social, cognitive, emotional, 
highly skilled process that has got a huge amount of value in it that just doesn't exist if we don't have that. Uh, if I could possibly come, come in on this, I mean, the, there's a, a, a sense of translation, which is so trivial, it hasn't yet been mentioned, which is just simply translating from academic language to business language. Um, academic language, even on management and business topics, can be uh, fairly opaque for, for the, well, I was going to say the average business, even the non-average businessman. Um, but I think there's a much more interesting aspect to, to translation. And there was a very good academic paper published a couple of years ago. Sadly, I wasn't expecting to talk about this, so I haven't got the details at my fingertips. I think it was by Michael Gill of Oxford about the process of negotiation um, that takes place when um, the consultancy with a set of new ideas, and I think the subject that he studied um, was digital transformation, how consultancy was sort of an approach to digital transformation actually helps an individual client um, undertake a transformation. And, and you know, by observing what went on in practice, he saw very much that it's, it's a process of negotiation and there has to be give and take from both sides. Uh, and actually one of his interesting observations was if they're sort of subsidiary processes um, that you also need to introduce. And I think one example was benchmarking, for example. Sometimes the subsidiary ones come in under the radar and get accepted um, you know, more or less as is whilst people are negotiating around the the main topic. Um, but there's a process of negotiating. Every time the consultancy go, goes into a, a client, ostensibly to do uh, what you might regard as the same kind of project, there will be a negotiation and the results of that negotiation can be very different for, for different clients. Thank you for that, Carol. Um, a couple of questions have come in, if I can pick them up. One from, which says, what's your advice for someone who is already an experienced academic but who has never done consulting? How should they approach organisations? I have some experience of that personally, just now that through the university who do a lot of consulting as I do, call it knowledge exchange, but it's frankly consulting, that much of it is that we have experienced academic shadowing people who have done consultancy before, like myself, to see how it works. And there's, there's actually a translational thing going on there and a real difference in culture that it, it seems to be more effective to bring them in through shadowing initially to see how the languages work etc i don't know if anybody else has got anything on that i'm becoming conscious of time because we're down to seven minutes and a hard, hard stop yeah just a short answer would be um depends on the type of academic work you're doing you know if you're looking to climate change or you're looking to you know new ways of doing crm or whatever join special interest groups because, um, uh, you know, whether they be on LinkedIn or business networks, you will find consultants there looking for ideas. And um, so, so focus on the topic or the theme that you're interested in. And, and you will find good consultants there because you don't want bad consultants, right? You want the curious ones sure. and they'll be there. Uh, thank you, Terry. Uh, from slightly brief then, another question for Nick. It says, thanks, Nick, for your comment regarding a research audience. In what way can academic journals be designed to appeal to practitioners at the same time? Thanks, Jim, and thanks for the question. Um, I, I, I saw the question a minute ago, and I was thinking, gosh, you know, this is it's a long and difficult problem. Um, and part of that is it relates not just to the journal, but if you think about the whole culture and system of academia, it is based, or in, in business and management at any rate, it's based around a particular esoteric form of publication that is judged by a very small minority of the world who have spent 20 or 30 years working on that particular way of thinking in a tiny microcosm. And so that means that these little cultures, I mean, we develop ways of talking to each other and what counts as knowledge and what doesn't count as knowledge. And we used the word rigor earlier, what counts as rigor and not, all of those things really matter. And then typically you undertake a two or three year project and boil it down into an 8,000 word um, 
uh, uh, paper. And so actually, I think it's really hard for that in one leap to also be useful and accessible um, to people who are in a different culture in reality. What I think it can do, I think there's a couple of things. One, it's really good to push academics to take at least one step in the direction of being open to translation. And so when we ask now for, think through some of the implications of this, both in terms of, you know, would, is there anything that arises from your paper that could have uses outside academia? Now, not everything immediately will, and not all academics, you know, are, are um, directed in that way of thinking. And that's, that's okay. I don't think all of it has to be. But I think there can be at least some step taken. But actually, I think the sorts of processes that, in fact, all of the other panelists have been talking about are perhaps more important um, because I think there is a move away from 8,000 technical words with endless tables that I might find fascinating and spent days reading, moving that into being something much shorter, much more direct, and something that gives the right sort of space both to consultants and to people in uh, professional practice. To, to take up. So I, that, that's why I was talking about translation earlier. I think we can do, we can take a step, but actually I think there's almost a specialist job to do of enabling a different sort of conversation to, to happen. Thanks for that, Nick. A quick observation for myself, the British Psychological Society, I've got a wonderful arrangement where they publish non-technical summaries of the vast amount of psychological research that goes on through the society. I suspect, I've never got, quite got to the bottom of it, that somebody, non-authors non are actually doing the publicizing, the copy editing is not the right expression, but I've forgotten the right expression, to actually publish 20 things. Here's 20 things that have been published in psychology in the last fortnight or whatever it is. And it's accessible and it's non-technical, but still rigorous and the connections to the background are there. Now, I'm down to two minutes, I fear. Any, anything you want to say? Oh, I wish I'd said that before we vanish. Yes, absolutely. Can I uh, call people to action um, for a, a, a project that, that, that we're initiating? If I could make so bold as to share the screen again. Um, nah. Uh, yes, simply, um, but we are launching this project. Um, we want to coordinate it through the SIGs. We're very keen to have people volunteer to, to work with us. Um, please do so through your, your SIG chair um, to, to make sure that we, we get the right kind of balance, you know, for particular uh, areas of special interest. Um, if, if you to want some more general information about what you're doing or have specific questions, uh, please contact me on, on the email address uh, that's up on the screen, karol.schlechczynski at cmc.org.uk. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that, Carol. I think that was an excellent way to conclude with a reminder to the wider audience that we are very much on a new network, but it's an area of work that Barnum's done for a long time and we've delighted to have the new approach of the network across the Academy of the British Academy and indeed beyond, and hopefully with Charter Management Institute, CIPD, and all the ones are upset by forgetting, forgetting the acronyms this year. But there's something we're looking to build on. I would like to remain to do then is thank everybody for their contributions. I know some of us are at the conference for the rest of the week. And feel free to talk to us at any point as you see us. Jeanette Hartley's here, who's one of the co-chairs. Carol's here, I'm here. And I know Nick is as well. And just like to thank everybody and very much like to close with the, the view that I think there's much to do, but many benefits to be gained from the outcomes of this. Because I'm not convinced the world's getting more complicated, but I do believe the world's getting more competitive have no advantages to be gained with this. Um, my histor historically orientated friends tell me the world isn't any more complicated than 100 years ago. And don't be so big headed to think it is. It wasn't. The Victorians did it much harder than we do. But we still need to collaborate together and work together to make it better because clearly the world faces issues that are needing solved. 
So those few words, I'd like to thank everybody, conscious of how busy people are. And for now, farewell. Thank you very much.